what I'm going to do is to take a case, an important case, biological case, a case that's been studied for, for a long period of time. It has biological and managerial implications. I want to talk about the case of the Chesapeake Bay oyster population. And I'm talking about both Maryland and Virginia, and I'm talking only about the public oyster population. I'm not talking about cultured oysters. I want to talk about the status of the Chesapeake Bay public oyster populations and how they got where they are now, which is very, very low. In the case of Virginia, it's much less than 1%. Don Pritchard once told me that I ought to go for, for mathematical rigor. Uh, well, less than 1% is close enough. It's really, really closer to less than, than a hundredth of a percent or even a thousandth of a percent. In Maryland, it's a little bit better, but that's primarily because Maryland has a large stretch of the estuary which is highly favorable to oyster production, much larger uh, stretch of the estuary, much larger in, in, uh, in square miles or square whatever it is you want to use than in Virginia. Now, most of the laboratories that are run, supported by the states, and in fact many of the academic laboratories that work on estuarine science, were established in order to solve one problem or another, usually with the fisheries, although it started, it started uh, perhaps a little bit earlier with, with public health problems because of pollution. wasn't hasn't been really very long that we have stopped putting raw raw sewage, in fact, into the into the to the Potomac River. Baghdad on the Potomac released raw sewage into the Potomac uh, until World War II. All right now, so that most labs were established to solve problems. And among the problems that they were established to solve, and this includes Chesapeake Biological Laboratory, uh, the old Virginia Fisheries Laboratory, VIMS, which, was, which is my organization, uh, or my, my affiliated organization, and uh, was, to, was to solve the problems of declining fishery populations. Practical. All you academicians, keep this in mind. Now. If I look back on the history of the oyster population and related to oyster management on the top and to oyster research on the bottom, I find that since 1880, this, I, shut, I turned off my data machine at 1992, but since 18, uh, 1880 or 1885 in the, case of, in the case of research, there's been a steady decline in the number of oysters versus the amount of research. The more research, the fewer the oysters. The more management, the fewer the oysters. Now, obviously, that's a, a kind of a nonsensical pair of, pair of curves, but it serves to illustrate a very interesting principle, and that is that for all of the research that's been done and all of the effort that's been made in management as far as Chesapeake Bay oyster populations, are concerned, they have been failures, right? Now let's ask why. In 1892 and 1894, or thereabouts, two, two uh, people uh, surveyed the oyster reefs of the Chesapeake. Stevenson in Maryland, that's blue, and light blue, and Baylor in Virginia, uh, that's green. Uh, and these are this is the distribution of oyster reefs in the Chesapeake Bay around 1890, 1880, 1890. These were legitimate reefs. In point of fact, one of the one of the points I do want you to want to make to you is that it seems to me very that there is very strong evidence going back in time 
reading Stevenson, looking at Winslow, looking at the other studies of the late 1800s, that in fact the Chesapeake Oyster Reef was probably the dominant benthic, benthic uh, 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 see, Mobius called it uh, biocenosis community. That is probably why oyster, why, why the bay is named Chesapeake Bay. It's supposed to be the Bay of Shells or Bay of Mussels or whatever that the Indians used, and that's probably why it was called that. Oysters, oyster reefs ranged all the way from the Linhaven Bay, there, lower bay up to James, all the way up the shore to north of the Patasico on the western shore, and from the Sassafras River all the way down on the eastern shore. It was a it was very dominant uh, organism, very dominant communities. And in fact, one of the biggest, one of the heaviest communities was right there uh, where Tom Jones uh, just showed a slide of in Pocomo and Tangier Sound. Winslow did some excellent studies of that. Now, this, is, this shows you the danger of not looking at the literature. Actually, I've been working around on oysters, with oysters, or had people working on oysters since 1955 as a director, of, and since 1959 as a director of the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And I had never gotten around to read, read uh, Stevenson 1894. And when I did, after I retired, I learned quite a bit. <laughs> now, I showed you the distribution of oyster reefs. This is what the reefs look like. Now, this is a hypothetical uh, drawing of a typical oyster reef of the time, breaking the surface at mean low water, generally, and, and uh, substantially uh, founded on shells in the bottom. This is just the generalized bottom, and this is, and, and, uh, the reef is established around a core of shells, dead, dead oysters that their remains, and detritus, feces, pseudo-feces, and everything else that got stuck in the, in the interstices between the shells. And then a veneer of living oysters uh, on the perimeter of it, and it was in such a situation that as the, as the, uh, Water depth rose during warming, since, since Chesapeake Bay was, was uh, established fin finally in its, in its final form around 2,500 years ago. Not very old. Obviously, there weren't any oysters in the Chesapeake Bay before there was a Chesapeake Bay. It was all fresh water and high land, dry land. All right? Now, this is what, it, this is what Dexter Haven and I believe that it looks like that it looked like the, the typical uh, reef, upthrusting reef in the Chesapeake Bay looked like at the time that uh, that the in, that the, the, the Indians worked on it, the colonists came, and in fact up until the time that those slides were drawn. Now, if you don't believe that this is that this is a, a true possibility, uh, I want to take uh, a minute to show you. This is Burwell's Bay in Burrells Bay in the, in the James River. The James River is one of our largest oyster producing areas, or it has been, over the years. It's something like the, the middle of the Chesapeake Bay for, for the Marylanders. Uh, it's been highly favorable. During, during a hydrographic survey made by the Old Coast Survey in 1872 in Burrells Bay, an oyster reef, long rock shoal, broke the surface, the top of the oyster reef broke the surface at mean low water, huh. and it was a mile and a half long, right? That's a lot of oysters. That was the tip of a mountain of oysters. You see the 12 foot, the 12 foot contour, the 60, the 6 foot contour uh, there, and then the long shoal reef. You could row out to it at mean low water, step off of it, off your, out of your boat, step onto it, and pick up oysters. All right? And it was done during the Civil War. The, some of the monitor, monitor class uh, Yankees mariners did that. They had, they had uh, uh, 
oysters relatively regularly on their on their mess room tables. Uh, now, if you ask someone today, probably if I ask you, what happened to the oyster? How come the oyster reefs are gone? How come the oyster, oyster population as evidenced by market oyster harvest, that's the only long-term data that we have, that is the catches that oystermen report, market oysters. What happened to it? You'd probably tell me, well, MSX or Dermacystidium killed them all. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's crop. It's been a crop all along. It's been a good way to get money to do research on MSX and Dermo, but it hasn't been, it isn't the real reason why oysters have declined in the Chesapeake Bay. Now let me tell you why I think that's so. I went back in the record uh, as far as all the data that I could dig up, and uh, this is, these are federal and state uh, data, and I plotted a line based upon the, the harvests of the time. Now, you might, purists might blast me for connecting points as far apart, say, as 15 or 20 years, but that's, that doesn't bother me a whole hell of a lot, because, in fact, what this, this, this really shows, this shows a true trend, and I have given you the points. I'm not trying to conceal anything from you. Now, what this shows is that, is that in Virginia, in 1880, there was some, there was a market oyster harvest of somewhere between six and seven million bushels, and that was Virginia bushels, and that was uh, uh, what was recorded, what oystermen reported. Oystermen have, over the years, underreported because, well, for various reasons. If you don't report it, nobody knows you got it, nobody knows you got paid for it, nobody knows that you owe taxes for it, right? All right, they deal in cash, cash on the barrel head. Now, point of all that is that in, in uh, around 1904, the maximum recorded catch of market oyster, oysters in Virginia waters was almost 8 million bushels, right? You see where, you see where it was in 1950. Now let me, uh, well it shows that, this, this shows bushels, thousands of bushels since 1930. That was, that was millions of bushels, this is thousands. Uh, you're talking about now, uh, from 1930 to 1990, these are the years that we have data every year for market oyster production. And this is from the public beds only, the self-renewing beds, all right? And you see what has happened. It has gone up and down, up and down, but generally the ups have been, each successive ups have been lower than the ups before, and the, and the downs have been lower. So that, so that the general trend has to be, you have to believe that something has gone wrong, right? Now let me point out to you that MSX was found in the in Virginia part of the Chesapeake Bay with significant to have produced significant mortalities. Let's assume that MSX really did it, because nobody has ever run Cox postulates on MSX. Okay. In 1959, now I'm going to ask you, what happened between 1904 and 1959, before MSX showed up. Well, now, it can't be MSX, at least before MSX was found, right? Well, it might not. It might be or might not. In what you need to get from this, what the young folks need to get from this, is you must always be skeptical. If your professor tells you that MSX did, did it, he's wrong. Right? <laughs> you must always ask, where are the data that you're that you're you're offering your opinion from? Right? Now, I showed you an oyster. I showed you Long Shoal Rock in the James River. 
there is, these are the James River seed beds or oyster beds as they were formerly. Very highly concentrated in this is Longshell Rock. So that this was a highly productive area of the lower Chesapeake Bay, tributary of the Chesapeake Bay, as far as oysters in Virginia. It consistently outproduced every other oyster reef in Virginia. Are you telling me something? <laughs> I'm going to ignore you. <laughs> now, another myth that is, has been propounded. Oystermen will always tell you when they're when you're they're asked or you're you're threatened to close their beds or whatever. Well, Doc, if we don't work them, they're going to die. You got to work them to make them grow, to keep them going. Well, that's another crop. You know, it always has been a crop. Unfortunately, early biologists helped them by offering some support for that concept, uh -huh. talking about reefs. Now, let me tell you what happened, and let me tell you why I say it's a crop. Keep in mind that there are 200,000 acres of public oyster beds in Virginia. Keep in mind that there's something less than 25,000 public beds of oyster oysters in the James River. Keep in mind that out of that 25, out of that 200,000 acres, during the period around 1985 or 86, a place like the Rappahannock, which which had which had uh, uh, about 99,000 acres, produced less than 200 bushels a year. Okay? In fact, the whole Chesapeake Bay went bust about that time. And the oystermen said, let's, let us, let's get into the James River. And the management people let them get into the James River. If we work them, they'll come back. Well, they did. They allowed them to harvest market oysters out of the James River, which had been a, had been a seed uh, operation for a number of years, as a matter of fact, almost since 1900. And this slide shows very clearly what happened. This is boat days. This is more numbers of market oysters in thousands, bushels. You see what happened when the bed, when the James was opened up to market oyster harvesting. 85, uh, 86, 87, the boat days went up. Market oysters went up. Ah, 87, 88, boat days went up up even higher, ah, but market oysters didn't go up higher. First sign of overfishing, or second sign of overfishing, is when you make, when you put more effort to catch less, you've obviously got some kind of a problem, right? And this continued. In other words, what I'm telling you here is two things. The watermen claimed that beds had to be worked in order to be productive, and then they were allowed to work them. And you see what happened? They worked them harder and harder and harder, and the catches went down, down and down. Predictable, all right? Now, now, in case you think this is only in Virginia, let's talk about Maryland. <coughs> Your Tidewater, Tidewater Management Group has been telling you lies for a long time. They're still telling you lies. This is Maryland market oyster production. Maryland market oyster production has been much higher than, than Virginia uh, market oyster production, primarily because it's got better growing grounds, more of them. Primarily because salinity protects it. All right? Now, the peak production in, in the Maryland portion of the Chesapeake Bay, is all, I, I've lumped public and private, but keep in mind that Maryland has always resisted private production, there's something less than 10,000 acres involved in this, and it wasn't worth taking and separating, right? Now, 1885, 86, almost 16 million bushels of oysters were produced. But Maryland managers say that NSX is what has caused them their problems. Well, in Maryland, you didn't have any significant mortalities from MSX until 1982. What the heck 
heck happened for that almost a century between 85, 86, uh, 19, 18, 1885, 86, and 1985. Well, it's pretty clear it wasn't MSX, it was in, Mar in Maryland's water. So, what really did happen? Well, in addition to market oysters and sea oysters that have been re removed from wherever they could be, could be gotten in Maryland and Virginia, sea oysters primarily in Virginia, but some in Maryland, but market oysters have been highest from Maryland waters. We have been taking over the years shells. And this is a shell pile from a uh, period around 18, 1840, 1850 in Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore, Maryland used to be the oyster capital of the world. If you weren't aware of it, around Pratt Street. And this is a, this is a lime uh, area where they, where they reduce shell to lime or later poultry grit. These, uh, this is, these are shells in the down, from a down bay area and they were used in road building, railroad building, and, and to build ground, build land in Crisfield, Annapolis, and other places like that. Now, what's the point of all that artist? And this is a wow. shell pile over, I think, on Ken Island now. This is a shell pile, shop, shells mined by Langenfeller Corporation in Maryland. From the public shell resources of the, of the free state of Maryland, almost, at almost no expense to Langenfeller in terms of access to the resource. All they have to do is make shells available to the state at some price, some market established price, and they're allowed, they're allowed to mine these shell resources. They euphemistically call them fossil shells. Well, that's a crop, too. That's, that's the same thing as happened in Virginia. We had, a, we had a shell mining operation that we finally shut off, and, and uh, they, were, they were mining fossil oyster shells. Well, what they were doing was, was mining, and what they are doing, is mining the foundation. In other words, have been, they're, they're, we're not satisfied now to have wiped out the upper part of the reef above the bottom. We're going after the, 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 the base. And we're destroying the potential for rebuilding the public beds on the bases, on their old bases. Now, what has happened to bring this about? Well, very clearly, overfishing of oysters and overfishing of their shells and destruction of the reefs, destruction of their favorite habitat. 19 90, 91, Dexter and I presented some material before the Chesapeake Bay Commission and later before Blue Ribbon Committee in Virginia. Blue Ribbon Committees, there's something that you establish to keep from doing anything constructive about management. <laughs> and what we did was recommend that, that the best thing to do was to start and rebuild the reefs reestablish the reefs. We did suggest that if they began to do that, they might have to close off harvesting for a significant period of time to allow the reefs to rebuild because the primary reason, primary reason is the reefs have disappeared is because they've been over harvested. Not because they died from MSX, not because they got ate by snails, or is it eaten? <laughs> uh, but because we allowed the oystermen to take too many. We allowed the shell harvesters to take too many. The numbers of bushels of shells that have been taken away from the reef system of, of Virginia and Maryland, systems of Virginia and Maryland, will never be known. But that outfit, uh, Langenfelder, is taking somewhere between three and seven million bushels a year, and they've been doing it for 30 years. All right, that's the end of my discussion.
Number one, always be skeptical. What you hear and read ain't necessarily so. You should always ask, where are the data? What do the data show? And you should always insist that people who continue to exercise the Santa Claus syndrome in doing research, interpreting data, you must be wary of. People that believe in Santa Claus will believe anything. <laughs> and that goes with a number of other things that are common belief in this, in this system. So, always be skeptical. Do not believe anything unless you see the data and unless it makes sense to you. That's what I have to offer you today.